good morning. It's so good to see you. What a blessed time of worship that was. What an awesome God that we have the privilege to worship um, together this morning. So uh, let's, uh, I just want to just want to go to the Lord in prayer before we do anything else this morning, and, uh, and then we'll get into His Word together, okay? So um, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to take this time to adore you this morning. Father, as we, such a sweet spirit in the place, as we worshiped you, the message you have for us today, is such a message that just shows how worthy you are to be adored, to be honored. just to be celebrated for the way you love us. And so, Father, I just would ask your spirit to help make this as clear for everyone as it's been for me so that they can just spend these next moments and the days ahead just adoring you. because we certainly don't deserve you. So Father, I just lay this at your feet and I just praise you. We praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so this morning we are going to be in Isaiah 25 and 26, but don't panic because this, these are songs, okay? So the songs go together, and we're going to look at the songs in that way. We're going to look at them together and see what Isaiah is so excited and what he is praising the Lord for so much this morning as we go into Isaiah 25 and 26. But you know... What it made me, I told the Wednesday night class, my thought was that we would be in Isaiah 8 at that point in the week. But my, you know, as the spirit moves, sometimes that changes. And so I was not only way off, I was in the, I was way off, right? Way, way wrong section of the book. And so I, I read through, and if you've been reading Isaiah, you've, you've seen a lot of this, but I was blessed to read through this point. And I got to 25 and 26, and it was like, um, have you ever, uh, one of my favorite things are rainbows. I, I, and I've shared that with you. I've, I've, I love rainbows because rainbows just make us look up and be reminded of the promise of God, that, that the rain and the storm doesn't last forever, right? Uh, I mean, there was a time where there was a lot of rain and a lot of flooding, right, several years ago in the past. And, uh, but it's a reminder of that. You know, the, the sunsets and the sunrises are a reminder uh, that, that, that God, it's just the way God shows off, right? He shows his greatness uh, through the beauty of what he's made. And so I, I love those kind of uh, just ways that God expresses himself to us. And when I got to this passage, it was like a, the best I can describe it, it was like a rush of wind, like just a a brightness all of a sudden in the midst of the gloom and darkness. And I was so incredibly encouraged by it. And then the bigger part is, okay, Lord, how do I share that with them the way that you just shared it with me? And that's where the real challenge is, right? And and the answer is, I can't. So I'm trusting in the Spirit to help you to see what God wants to be seen today about him. So I'm so excited about this. When we was in Michigan, we were on a on a mission trip up there this past year, and y'all, y'all remember that, and y'all prayed. Many of you probably prayed diligently for the team that was in Michigan. And, and one of the things that Pastor Jeremy told me, uh, he was telling a testimony, he was sharing a testimony of when he was at Clear Creek. And he said that at Clear Creek, they were planning on this like town revival, like down town Pineville Kentucky like they were they had preachers coming in it was just like this time of revival on the square and so he said the day it came about they had all this stuff planned they had been working on it they had found as we do when we try to do things for God there are obstacles there are stumbling blocks put in our way there were all those things present there and the day that it was set to take place 
it was calling for nothing but rain. You know how that works, right? It was going to be outside. All the planning had went in, but, but all of a sudden, all that was in the forecast seemingly was rain. But Jeremy said, uh, we're just going to have faith. We, we feel like God is leading us to do this, and so we are going to do it regardless. And we're just going to step out in faith. And he told about how when they did that, how it was like that there was this time, and it's been multiple times in his life where it was like the, the storm cleared away in that moment and the brightness of the sun shone through and all of a sudden they had the weather that they needed to preach and proclaim the good news of God right there in the town square in Pineville, Kentucky. That sounded really old a few years ago, right? Right in the town square, right? But right in the town square in, in Kentucky, in Pineville, Kentucky to proclaim the good news. And, and, and that's just a glorious picture to me of what this is about this morning. In the, in the midst of darkness, and let me, let, me, let me say this, I think that God, I think that, that he wants to encourage you today in such an incredible way, in such a loving way, that it blows my mind the love that's, that he expresses to us. Like, like, I believe that, and that's, and that's really where it leaves me, is I'm just like, Lord, well, we don't, why? you know, I mean, but, but I believe that he wants you because I know that some of you are going through or have been going through really hard times. I know that, that some of you have really been struggling, and sometimes the struggle has been very long. I know that there are many obstacles and challenges that I don't even see and don't even know that you all face and walk through every day. But there's a God in heaven who knows and who sees you right where you are. There's a God in heaven that even though we are so disobedient, even though we fall so short, even though we struggle and sometimes are, are, are just really even struggling to even get out and walk at all, that there is a God that loves us anyway. And it may sound so simplistic, but I can't wrap my mind around that. The, the more that I read about God, the more I'm just blown away at the way that he loves us intimately and individually, how he loves you as his people. And he loves you in, in various ways, right? He loves you in judgment. Judgment is love. It wouldn't be love if he just let you live wrong and destroy yourself without any consequence to come. He loves you in judgment. He loves you in discipline. He loves you in grace. He loves you in mercy. He loves you in so many of the ways that we're like, God, why are you doing this? He's doing it because he loves you. Because God is love. And so I was reading in Isaiah, and I, I, I was reading through the book, and this is what I found as I read through, and I think it should be on the screen for you here in just a minute, but I found just a bit of a background of how we get to where we are today. There is a whole lot of judgment to get through to get there. I mean, a whole lot of judgment. As a matter of fact, after chapter 12 of Isaiah, there is pretty much nothing but judgment until you get to chapter 25. And the judgment doesn't stop with one nation or two nations, but it's like basically the world. There is judgment, judgment, judgment. And, and sometimes, and I have to believe this is like life, right? Sometimes don't you feel like in life that you're just wading through thick clay mud, you know, that real good stuff that sticks to your shoes and even pulls your shoes off. Sometimes when you try to lift your leg out of the mud, I mean, don't you feel like that life sometimes leaves us? just weary, just covered in mud and, and hard to lift your feet one leg after the other from day to day. Do you ever feel like that? And I'm reading through Isaiah and I'm literally, I'm, I'm in, I feel like I'm in the trenches with him because of the spirit of God. And I'm like, oh my goodness. I mean, what must it have been like to proclaim such a challenging word over and over and over again? But that was the mission that Isaiah volunteered for. Here am I, send me, you remember? 
And, and he volunteered for it, and I, and I started looking at, looking at it, but as you see on the screen, there is judgment that comes in a mass quantity. And it doesn't stop, it starts, and this is interesting, it starts with the house of God, the, the nation of Israel, right? Judgment starts in the house of the Lord. And so it, it starts with the nation of Israel. So we talked about on Wednesday night out of the Isaiah 8 and Isaiah 13, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, judgment, Moab, Damascus, Egypt, Babylon, Tyre, and then in Isaiah 24, the whole earth and judgment proclaimed on it all. And I, as you read through it, and I don't know if you've, if you've been there, I won't ask us to raise our hands. I'm sure you have, Bible scholars, you know, real students. Of this, but as you read through it, you, see, you just get to this place where it's like you hope that the next chapter there's something else other than judgment. Because judgment is hard. And judgment is unpleasant to walk in. And judgment is challenging. And judgment is not something that we look forward to, but it is the expression of God's love in that he doesn't leave us like we are, but he says, I want better for you. I have better for you, but you've got to come to me to find that. Judgment, 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 judgment. And then in Isaiah uh, chapter 24, the judgment is not to a specific nation, but the judgment is to the whole earth. And in Isaiah 24, something amazing happens that God reveals something to Isaiah that is to still come that we have not even seen in our lifetime. There is a tribulation that's going to come for the whole earth. There is a kingdom that's going to be established in the Savior, a kingdom that's going to last forever. And we know as we read the prophecy in the scripture, we know that there is a day to come of tribulation for the world and of a glorious reigning with a savior for the people of God. We know there is a day to come and, and God reveals this to Isaiah. And you know, the other incredible thing is this, is that Isaiah, in all of the judgment that was coming, Isaiah probably really needed these visions uh, of encouragement, of glory, of the greatness of God, because sometimes in the midst of all the challenging messages, we just need to see God in all of his glory. Because you gotta know that Isaiah was probably not a favorite among the people he was preaching these messages to, right? I mean, I'm sure that everybody wasn't running to him and be like, Isaiah, give us another judgment, right? Give us another message on judgment. We just can't wait to hear what God has shared with you today. Give us a prophecy that tells about our destruction, right? I mean, that, that is not typically what we run to try to find. And so when Isaiah was coming, there was probably maybe even some hesitancy because, uh, because the messages were harsh and they were judgment. But, but the reality was, was that God said, Isaiah, I want you to share my message and that's it. Share my word with the people. And that's the thing is that it's, it's sometimes the word that is shared is hard. Sometimes it is challenging, but we don't have the authority to take it upon ourselves and control the word that God has. It's his word. He is the king. And so you go through all this judgment, you go through chapter 24, where it's not just the, the, this nation or that nation, but it is the earth, it is the world, and then you come into 25, and this is really, 25 and 26 is what started it all for me going into Isaiah. I said, how did we get to this place? Where did this verse come from? And then as I read it through and God magnificently revealed these chapters, I was blown away at the greatness of where this came from. I want you to see this. In Isaiah 25, I just want to read one verse for us just to start it off. It says, Isaiah says this as he goes from a time and a season of a lot of messages on judgment. And he says, O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name for you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. 
I get to chapter 25 and I say, Isaiah, how can you say, what is going on? He begins this song of God's faithfulness. He begins this song of exaltation of the Almighty God. We've talked about the past two weeks uh, that, that God, uh, he is the king. He is the Lord of hosts. We talked last week about how God should be exalted. He needs to be exalted. He is worthy of our exaltation. We talked about how he is the one on the throne and Isaiah gets to this place after, after a season in judgment and he says God you are exalted you are my God and I look at that and I say Isaiah look at everything that God's been saying You've been walking through a season of judgment and tribulation and difficulty. You are preaching and ministering among a people that don't want to hear. They have ears, but they don't hear. They have eyes, but they don't see. And you preach and you prophesy and you teach and they continue to do their own thing. And then he begins a song. Oh, Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name. For you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. You see, because what God is going to give an Isaiah a glimpse of and what God gives us a picture of is the hope that is to come. He says that in the last part of that, plans form long ago with perfect faithfulness. God gives Isaiah a glimpse of what is to come. God has given Isaiah a picture of his greatness. He has seen him, seen God and the glory of God, and it wrecked him and it changed everything in his life. And, and after all this judgment, it, it is revealed to Isaiah that there is a day, there is a kingdom that we haven't even seen yet that's going to come and Jesus is going to rule. And, and this kingdom is everlasting. And we know that even though there may be seasons of judgment for the child of God, there is hope to come. There is hope. It's not, it's not the end. It's not over. We don't have to fear or even be that we can always have hope. So in Isaiah's song, he's going to talk about a correct waiting posture for this hope. And that's what I want to talk with you about this morning. That's what I think God's word wants to talk. Because here's the thing about us. We are terrible at waiting. Yes? Right? Uh, so it's not just like, like uh, but, but God's word says, listen, we have, there is a waiting posture. Because here's the thing. Do you all believe that Jesus is coming back? Yes. Amen. Right. Do you believe that he's going to establish his kingdom here, his earthly kingdom? There's going to be a millennial reign. There's going to be eternity for the children of God with and in the presence of God. Yes. And so it doesn't matter, really. It's not one of these things. And a lot of times what we do, we get bent out of shape on the details. Right? Well, what's that going to look like? And it's nice to get in there and know. But this is the thing we got to know that we know that we know it's coming. Right? And so the details will be what they are. I guarantee that everybody in this room, including myself, are going to miss some of those details about what it's going to look like. And that's okay. I've come to terms with it. It's God's plan and I trust him with it. But we know that one day he is going to return. We know that there is going to be eternity with God and that all the tears and the sorrow and the brokenness and the mud and the mire and the judgment are going to stop. And we are going to behold the glory of the king. And forever we are going to be in the presence of the king of kings and the Lord of lords. There is a day when all that you are struggling with in this moment, when all of the loved ones that you are missing, when all of the, the struggles in your mind that you are having, when everything that you are facing, the sicknesses, the difficulties, the mud, the discipline, everything that you're facing is going to be gone and you're going to be in the presence of the great healer, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There is coming a day. And so in all of Isaiah's judgment, in all of the messages of judgment, it's like God reveals to him this day and he says, and he's going to reveal to us how you and I need to be waiting for that day. 
with eyes that are looking up. And that's another reason I love the rainbows and the sunsets and sunrises because what does that do for us? It causes us to look up. It causes us to look toward the coming of the king. There is coming a day, and Isaiah gets to see it. And even though Isaiah's messages is, is even to the point of chapter 24, there is a great tribulation that's coming for all of the earth. The end of the story is not with that tribulation. It's the beginning after that of a kingdom that will last forever. It's an eternal kingdom that is coming, and there is all tears and all sorrow and all difficulty. Is all, it's all stripped away just for his glory. And, and, and Isaiah gets to see it. And he says this, I love that, that, that phrase, with perfect faithfulness. And I gotta tell you that the God we serve is perfect in his faithfulness. In every component, he is perfect. Even when you say, God, I don't understand, that's okay. He's still perfect in his faithfulness. When you say, God, I, I'm just struggling so much, that may be the case, but he's perfect in his faithfulness. God, I'm overwhelmed and I, and I don't have the answer and I want it to happen right now. And that is every man, woman, child, we want it right now, right? But still, even though it doesn't come right then, God is perfect in his faithfulness. Even in judgment, God is perfect in his faithfulness. Isaiah says, God, you will be exalted. And not just this, look at, look at how he describes God. Now, Isaiah has a sight. He's seen God. He's experienced God in miraculous ways, in intimate ways. He says in verse number four of Isaiah 25, he says, um, you, for you have been a defense for the helpless, a defense for the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat, for the breath of the ruthless is like a rainstorm against a wall. Like heat and drought, you subdue the uproar of aliens. Like heat by the shadow of a cloud, the song of the ruthless is silenced. God takes care of the needy, doesn't he? He takes care of those. Let me, let me, let me say this. God has such a fatherly touch. Have you ever noticed that? Like the small details that you and I don't think anything about, God knows. Let me, let me say, there are, there are some times, it's so amazing to me, I'm blown away, how God uses you in maybe ways, you all, in maybe ways you don't even know. You know, there are times that in all of our life that God may say to us, hey, I want you to, to share an encouragement with someone. I want you to just love on someone just a little bit. Just reach out and say, hey, I'm praying for you. Now, now, when we get a message like that from God, sometimes we, we have a hesitancy and we say, well, uh, is that true? Do they need to hear from me? I just saw them, right? Uh, but, but one of the things, one of the ways that God has really been a father to me is that in those moments, and you all probably been there, when it was really hard and the mud was getting really deep and I was, I was really struggling and I'll get that one message that says, hey, I was just thinking about you today. And you know what that says? Even though that comes through you, that's God through you. And you know, even though you may look at that and you may say, well, that's not a big deal. That's a huge deal. That's a huge deal, isn't it? Because, because in that moment, it just feels like the hand of God reaches down and say, I still see you, my son. Don't give up hope, my daughter. Don't, don't forsake. Don't abandon. Don't run away. Don't get discouraged there. I still see you and I love you. And in, and in 25 and 26, I believe that after all the judgment, God reveals the greatness to Isaiah of what's to come as if to say, all hope is not lost. So the second thing we see is we go on down to chapter 25 of Isaiah and verse number nine. Look at what he says. He begins to tell us about the weight. It says, and it will be said in that day, behold, this is our God for whom we have waited that he might save us. 
This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. The other thing that I was reminded of as I read this is that salvation belongs to God. There is no other way to find salvation other than in the arms of the Father. And so in Isaiah, the posture is, he says, wait. Wait for what? Wait for the only one that can save you. There, there, is, there is no one else. There is no other way to find salvation. There's not salvation in, in, in church. And we've talked about this in church attendance and baptism. There's not salvation in any of those things. The salvation comes from God. God is the author of salvation. We don't deserve it, but he has graciously saved us in Jesus Christ, those of us that have surrendered our life to him. And he says here, look, this, behold, this is our God, whom we have waited that he might save us, because without him, there is no other hope for salvation. So we wait, and the waiting posture is an expectant posture. It's waiting knowing, not questioning, not doubting, but knowing that salvation is in God, knowing that he is going to come again, knowing that what we experience today is not the end of the story because of the glory of the one that is our God. And here's the thing is we, we live in a world where it's easy to substitute other things for our salvation. It's easy to, to substitute our good works. It's easy to substitute baptism. It's easy to substitute church attendance. It's easy to substitute our own knowledge and say that that must be the way that I get to salvation. But I want to tell you, there is no other way other than him. Salvation, you're only going to be saved by God. You're only going to be saved in Jesus Christ. There is no other way to be saved. All those other things may be good, but they are not God. And salvation belongs to God. God is the one that saves. And so we wait. We wait. We wait for the one that's going to save us. We wait for the one that brings salvation. We know, we wait expectantly, and we know that, that this is not the end of the story, that there are more things to come for the child of God. And the incredible way that God has painted this picture of the book of Isaiah, he says not only in the midst of judgment is, is judgment coming for disobedience, but he said, listen, I'm going to tell you as well about salvation. So in Isaiah 7, Chapter, or verse 14 through 16 in Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 7 in Isaiah chapters 11 and 12, God's word tells us that there is a branch, that there is the, a one that's coming called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, that the government is going to be on our shoulders. It tells us of the one that's going to be born of a virgin, that child that's going to come. And so in the process of it all, Isaiah comes back because none of this has happened yet. Yet. And Isaiah comes back and he says, behold, this is our God. We waited that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Because even though this is hundreds of years before any of this is going to come to pass, God says, I have a plan for mankind. Isaiah, you are immersed in judgment. A people are living in disobedience. Isaiah, I know this is hard. Even to the point Isaiah says, how long do I need to proclaim? And God says, it gives him the length of time. But the reality was, as God said, but there is hope that is coming. And for us, there is hope that has come. And we sang about that this morning. And our hope that has come is alive. The price has been paid. The, 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 the cost for all of your and my offenses has already been covered by the blood of Jesus. If we will only repent and come into his arms, there is salvation. God has sent the Savior so that we could be saved. Glory to his name. He has come. 
And in, the, in light of all of this, in, in, in light of everything that is going on in Isaiah's life, all that God has been revealing to him, he has also revealed the hope to come. Sometimes in the midst of our troubles, we get so caught up in our circumstances that we lose sight of the hope to come. And so we get bogged down that, that things have not happened like we wanted them to happen. Things have not happened like we planned. But the reality that we have to remember is that regardless of how things happen, it doesn't change who God is. God is faithful regardless. God is loving regardless. God doesn't need me to understand. He needs me to walk by faith and trust him even when I don't understand. And a lot of times in our finite minds, aren't we at a place where we don't understand? But I can tell you, the love of the Father is so great that I don't need to understand. I just need to trust in the one who has the plan. And so he says that we must wait and salvation is in him. Now, the, the, the only danger as we look to this millennial age, the only danger as we look at this prophetic vision that God has given Isaiah and he is beholding these great things to come is that if we have not experienced salvation in God, if he has not saved us in his son, Jesus Christ, then we don't get to experience that hope for all eternity that God's talking about. That hope is only found in him. Salvation is only found in him. So for you and I to, to, to try to substitute anything else, and so often we do, and try to, to think about, oh, well, I'm probably okay. Oh, I hope that I get there. Listen, you don't have to hope. You can know because Jesus is alive. And salvation is in Jesus. Salvation is in him. So not only do we find uh, that after judgment comes hope, we find that God is salvation. And then finally, we are going to discover here in Isaiah 26, the proper posture that we should have. And this is where it all began. Isaiah 26, verse 8. It continues with the song that Isaiah is singing to the almighty God. And let me just say this, my prayer for Rolling Hills Baptist Church, myself included, would be that we would long for God this way. It would be that our posture in our waiting, because we're all waiting for the Savior to come, we're all waiting for eternity, we're all waiting that our posture would look like this as we wait. Look at what he says. Indeed, while following the way of your judgments, O Lord, we have waited for you, and pick out these words, eagerly. As a deer pants for water, so my soul thirsts for you. Eagerly, he says. Your name, even your memory, is the desire of my soul, of our souls. At night, my soul longs for you. Indeed, my spirit within me seeks you diligently. Do you, do you see those words? They should be on the screen for you. These words of, of desire, these eagerly, longingly desiring his name, diligently seeking him. Did you pick up on that? Is he, that, that, that it was like he was the only one that could satisfy the thirst. He was the only one that could bring satisfaction to our soul and to our life. Just like we, even more than we long for coffee or desire this and that in our everyday life that we would just long for him so much that we just can't be quenched without him. That we would be in this place, that we would be uh, the prostrate before him and say, God, I just, I just want to see you. And I was convicted this week about something that I can do sometimes, and I'll just tell it on myself. Sometimes when I read, I may read to find a message, but I won't read just to be with him. Do you know there's a difference? Sometimes I'll pray quick because I know I'm supposed to pray, but I won't pray just to be with him. I just pray because it makes me feel better about where I am. God, I know this is something you tell me to do. 
Sometimes I leave my quiet times feeling like, Lord, I didn't even give you the chance. I just went through emotion and I did what, what I know that I should do and I know in my mind that I should do and even though I was doing it and I was ritualistically going through the motion, my heart was not there. And even when I go to find a message, I go with a consumer mentality, not just a worshipful spirit. And when I read this, I just see this picture I can just, you can picture it, that, that what, what it's going to look like one day when we all are before his throne as children of God, when we all are there worshiping and rejoicing and just laid out on the floor before the greatness of the one that's on the throne, just, just absolutely prostrate there and crying out and praising him and in peace and comfort and joy because finally the one that we have served, we see him high and lifted up. And when I see this, that's the picture I see. Lord, may our church, may Rolling Hills Baptist Church, may everybody who's on the live stream and that tunes in, may all of us be like this as we wait for his return. May all of us prostrate ourselves in our waiting place like this where we are eager, where we desire, where we are diligently seeking him and longing for him. Longing for him. Now, longing for him is not longing for a cure. You see, he is the cure. Sometimes we can be bombarded with our prayer requests. And I'm not saying prayer requests are wrong. I'm glad that we, that we do, that this is such a praying church. And prayer requests are important, but you need the longing for him. Uh, longing for him is not just going to him because you, you someone, uh, some weird pastor asks you to do a devotion on the fly and you got to put it together quick and you're trying to read to find it. It's not going to him for anything else. It's not going to him for asking for things. It's not going to him because life isn't what you want. You want to complain. It's not going to him for any other reason than just going to him and saying, God, I see who you are and it is amazing. And I just want to stay at your feet for a little while. Please let me stay and just worship who you are. Come, let us adore him for who he is, just for a little while. God, actually, any amount of time you would allow us to just be at your feet. God, I don't want to ask you anything. I don't want to do anything other than just worship, worship, worship for all eternity. I long for you as a deer pants for water, so my soul. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Lord, help this to be the desire of our soul to just be in your presence. Because as Isaiah found out, in his presence is healing from everything. Sometimes we think that if we ask, and, and that's where, but I'll tell you that just being in his presence heals. It heals what doctors can never touch. Just being in his presence transforms how you minister, how you see, how you love him, how you serve him. Just being in his presence. It transforms how you pray. 
Isaiah 25 and 26 is a song or songs of praise to a God, even though it is a God that is a God that judges, even though Isaiah has experienced that. Isaiah says, listen, we are waiting for your promises to be fulfilled. We are waiting for you to return. And we are waiting with a posture that is the, the, all these things in eagerness and longing and, and just desiring for you, God. We are seeking, and I love the word diligently, we are seeking you diligently, because God, we, I just want to be, we just want to see you. You know, it seems like it's something that I repeat so much, but oh, that we would be a people that just see him. That just see him. Because, you know, a glimpse of God changes everything, doesn't it? Isaiah saw him, and all he could do was cry, woe is me. You know, sometimes even as we pray, we say, well, I don't know what words to say. Listen, when you see him, it doesn't matter. You just worship you just repent. You just cry out. It's not a script. It's not a right thing or wrong thing. It's a heart condition, isn't it? When Isaiah saw him, it wasn't, he wasn't thinking, man, I hope I get this prayer right. Right? He wasn't thinking, man, I, I don't want to miss a word. He said, woe is me, because once he saw him, he was shattered in his core. So let me ask you this as we go into an invitation time this morning. Well, let me encourage you and then ask you this. For all the hurt that is out there today, that is online today, there is a greater amount of hope, far more than what we can ever imagine that is to come for the child of God. For all the, 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 those suffering with lost loved ones, those suffering with sicknesses, those of any capacity, those struggling even in, in relationships or spouses or whatever the case may be, for whatever you find yourself facing today, we serve a God who gives us a message and a glimpse in his word of the hope to come. So even though we are discouraged now, as he shows Isaiah, even in the midst of that, you don't have to live there. You can prostrate your yourself before God and see that there is something he has planned that's greater than we can ever imagine. There is a, a hope to come more than we will ever deserve so that even in those moments you can know because God has revealed himself this way that you are loved more than it even makes sense by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I mean, you are, in, and as I read more and more, that's what I see. God genuinely loves us intimately. Every single one of us. You don't have to be discouraged. You don't have to give up hope. You don't have to say, well, I just don't know what to do because there is a plan. He was faithful, as he says, with perfect faithfulness that God has put in place and we can trust that he'll see it through to the end. But I want to say this. How many of us are truly going after and waiting for the Lord this way? eagerly longing, desiring, seeking, like true seeking, not sinking, bypassing it every once in a while, not longing for a moment and then being distracted by something else, but truly just being in his presence, desiring him more than anything else. How many of us are there? Let me ask you to do this. Will you pray with me that we will be a people that long for God this way? Will you cry out to the throne and say, Lord, help us to wait like this because he's worthy of this. 
And if you're here today and you haven't experienced salvation, you haven't experienced, as Isaiah said, we waited that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. If you have not experienced the saving faith that is found in, at the feet of Jesus Christ, the knowledge of him, salvation, if you've not experienced that, God has done everything for you to be saved. All you have to do is surrender. As that spirit works on your heart and God moves in your life, you need to surrender because the hope comes for the children of God. Or maybe you're here today and you say, and I, this is really my prayer. I really hoped that you all could just see the way that God showed it to me. So maybe you're here today and you say, oh man, what a picture of God. And you want to come to the altar and you just want to worship. Or you want to worship right where you are. Please do that. He's worthy of that. Just worship. Father, God, we adore you. It's so hard, Lord, to understand the way you love us. It's hard for me, Father. I see all these messages of judgment for disobedience that we have, people have towards you. And there's a glorious picture of eternity, of what's to come. Lord, I'm reminded that even though we are sinful people, oh, Father, that you would make a way for our salvation. It just amazes me. And Lord, I really don't have near enough words to say to honor you the way you deserve but we just want to adore you. Oh, Father, just adore you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for all eternity that you would love us like you do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.